I want to start off uh, by uh, thanking the Academy for giving me the chance to say I'd like to thank the Academy, which as a filmmaker is something that we always dream of. Um, if someday when Hell Freeze is over, uh, I win an Oscar and I get up there and you're watching on TV and I say, I'd like to thank the Academy, you'll know that I'm talking to all of you. So, um, it's really great to be uh, back here and an honor to be kicking off Artsmania. Um, the last time I was on the stage, indeed, back in the 1840s, was uh, co-hosting with Miss Wilson's son, uh, the talent show. Um, and so, you know, to me, my motto has always been, those who can't do, post. Um, anyway, as you can see, I was wearing white leather pants and a flowered shirt, uh, and we sang uh, Staying Alive from uh, Saturday Night Fever. And I'm still not sure whether that was the high point of my uh, artistic career or the low point. It may have been both. I'm not entirely sure. Um, until a couple days ago, I thought that uh, I was actually just going to come up here and answer questions uh, about the film you're going to see this afternoon. Um, but since you won't be seeing the film until this afternoon, uh, that seems like a stupid idea now. Um, so instead, what I thought I would do is kind of pre-answer the questions that you're actually going to have after the movie, if that makes any sense. Uh, and hopefully it'll give you some things to think about uh, while you're watching it. Um, quick thing, I just want to see, has anybody actually seen Louder Than a Bomb yet? So I just want to show that. Woo! All right, excellent. Okay, good. That's great. Um, I, I don't want to spoil anything that happens in the film for you guys, so uh, when we get to the point where I'm talking about the big plot twist or the, the Will Ferrell cameo, uh, I'll just send everybody else out of the room and make it talk. So yeah. Um, before talking about kind of how uh, Loud and the Bomb came about and, and questions. Um, I figured I'd give a quick explanation for how I got from being on the stage in white leather pants 27 years ago to being on the stage in jeans today, which I think is progress, I'm not sure. Um, I'd love to say that uh, back when I was sitting in, in your seat, uh, I was a kid with all kinds of dreams and plans, uh, but that's not true. Uh, I had no clue whatsoever what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, all I knew was that I liked history, so uh, that's thanks to Lou Schultz. Uh, I liked stories, and I was nerdy enough to like documentaries. Uh, I also loved playing sports, but uh, it became pretty apparent by sophomore year that that wasn't going to happen. Um, my, my legacy, my athletic legacy at Academy came actually the year after I was cut from the JV basketball team, when they were having kind of a bad season after a couple of good years, coincidentally when I was on the team. Um, and uh, the coach called all the players together and started to yell at them. And finally, still not sure why, he said, you know what this team needs? This team needs somebody like Greg Jacobs. He was too short, too slow, and had no basketball talent whatsoever. But damn it, he went out and got hurt every day in practice. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. I'm not sure any pictures or awards or anything to show that. So how I actually ended up making documentaries, though, uh, is a journey that, that, like a lot of journeys, only makes sense uh, when you're looking back on it. Uh, after I graduated from college, uh, I came back here to Columbus to get a master's degree in history uh, at Ohio State and to write a book about school desegregation here. Um, so you know, while I was writing it, I actually moved back to Chicago and answered this mysterious ad for a radio producer job in the local weekly paper. Uh, it was probably the only ad in history that actually said liberal arts or humanities graduate student prefer, because I think it had to be for me. Uh, either that or my mom did pay for it to make me feel better. Uh, anyway, uh, something like 300 people applied, uh, but I ended up getting the job because the host of the show actually gave a quiz about history and pop culture uh, to all the applicants, um, just random questions, basically. Um, so if you're ever sitting in class and thinking, what, what use am I going to have for this information? I can tell you that someday, somewhere, it might come in handy. Um, after a couple of years there uh, at the radio station, I started asking around to see if anybody uh, had any, knew of any other jobs available. You know, it was one of these jobs that you could only have a couple of years without completely going crazy. Um, and one of the DJs said, I know a guy who makes documentaries, you should call him. Uh, so I went for an interview at a place called Towers Productions, uh, which, uh, as Wilson said, made documentaries for cable channels like A&E and uh, they were growing so fast, basically, that they were at the time uh, that they would hire pretty much anyone who was breathing 
Um, so, as a member of the Breathing American Community, <laughs> I got the job. Um, I ended up working over the next seven years on something like 200 documentaries, uh, which was great. Uh, and the amazing part about it was I was comparing to sort of like being in med school for documentaries. Um, the same way doctors learn to kind of see the body as a machine that you can manipulate and move in certain ways, I came to see the documentary as that too. Uh, a machine made up of working parts that you can move around for maximum effect. Uh, and all that training and all that hard work has been hugely valuable. Uh, the bad part was that of those 200 shows, so many of them were true crime shows that it totally screwed up my brain. Um, so now, unfortunately, if somebody rings our doorbell at 7 o'clock at night, my first thought isn't, oh, it's our neighbor and they're coming over to borrow some sugar or something. It's, oh my god, it's psychotic teen thrill killers. <laughs> Call the cops. So, so that can't be helping, I don't think. Um, in January 2005, I joined forces with a friend of mine, John Siskel, uh, and we started the creatively named Siskel Jacobs production. Uh, a month later, I was driving with my wife down Clark Street, which is like a, you know, right by Ripley Field where the Cubs play. And uh, we passed by a famous rock club called the Metro. And just instinctively, I kind of looked up uh, to see who was playing that night, because that's the place where you know, it's always, all the big bands always play before they get paid. Uh, and the sign on the marquee that night said, Louder Than a Bomb, High School Poetry Slam Finals, tonight. And when I looked down, there was a line of kids of all shapes and sizes and colors down the block. Um, and that is a really weird thing in Chicago, because the city of Chicago is incredibly segregated. And so to see that kind of diversity on the north side of Chicago, uh, Saturday night, to see poetry for fun, was strange in so many ways that I thought, hmm, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I remember, I don't remember ever going to see poetry for fun when I was in high um, and definitely not on a Saturday night, so, you know, that was weird enough. Uh, but it also made me realize that for all these kids to be there watching poetry, it also meant that there were kids that were getting up on stage performing poetry. And that was completely mind-boggling to me. Um, because, uh, you know, I remember being in high school and writing a lot of awful poetry. Um, the thought of actually getting on stage and performing it <laughs> is horrifying. And, uh, and believing nobody would ever want to hear. Um, so the notion that there were these incredibly brave high school students who were getting up and talking about their personal stories uh, on stage uh, was kind of awesome to me. Um, so all these things made me think, you know, maybe we should take a look. And as filmmakers, as documentary filmmakers, that's what we do. In exchange for things like fame and fortune, uh, we get to go ask strangers questions when they're doing things that interest them. Um, so that Monday, I went back to work and I mentioned it to John, my, my, my partner, and he said, sure, why not, let's check it out. Uh, so that's how Loud of the Bomb actually got started, that's what we're gonna see today. Um, if it hadn't been for driving by that sign at that time of night, uh, my life would be, I think, totally different today. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. A few weeks later, uh, John and I met with Kevin Tobel, who you'll see in the film, is the poet who founded the Loud and the Bomb Poets, uh, which you'll also learn involved about 46 teams from schools all over Chicago. It's now, in the years since, up to over 110 schools from all over Chicago and the suburbs. So it's really grown. Uh, Kevin sort of became our tour guide for the next year and a half and introduced us to the kids and the coaches uh, and sent us out to the schools that were really serious about this competition that we didn't know anything about. Um, now it's always very easy for me when I'm thinking about an idea for a film to identify all the reasons it's not going to work. Because films are kind of like relationships where you don't want to get into a bad one because you know it's going to last a long time. Um, so it's very easy to say no, it's very easy to find ways to get out. Um, I'm sure none of you have that here. Um, but the great thing about Loud of the Bomb was that the more we spent time with people, the more we kept saying, wow, this is really good. Uh, everything we did and everywhere we went seemed to confirm that there was something here, uh, which is you know, kind of the clue that you're on to something. So by the time the actual competition rolled around uh, in the spring of 2007, uh, we pretty much knew the characters and the teams that we wanted to follow for the film. That was that's a part of the process called development. 
Uh, but just to make sure we also let the kids who are participating weigh in. So we would go and we'd ask them, uh, you know, who should we follow? Who's really good? And they would say, oh man, you gotta, you know, you gotta check out Nate, or oh, I haven't gotten it, he's the best. So you'll get to know uh, these guys very well uh, this afternoon. Um, but it was basically a way of making sure that the kids had a voice in the process all the way. Uh, in the end, we ended up settling on the four teams that you'll see. And uh, you know, they are great kids with incredible stories, um, you know, talented and brave and all these things. But they're also incredible poets and performers. And that was really key for us. Because we couldn't have a film that you would say after an hour, like, wow, I love these characters who provide poetry. Um, so their work had to be really strong, strong enough to sustain a whole hour and a half long movie. Uh, and as I think you'll see this afternoon, we sort of hit the jackpot on that. And it happened to be a great year for, uh, for the performances, and the kids were spectacular. Um, we started shooting the film in the spring of 2007, in the fall of 2007, sorry. Uh, and with this kind of thing, there's always a process of building trust and making sure your characters, uh, people that you're following, are comfortable being in front of the camera. If you want them to act naturally, you don't want them to feel like they're performing. We are just a fly on the wall, and we kind of capture what's going on. Um, and admittedly, it's definitely weirder for a film like this, where you are having to go to someone's parent and saying, hi, we're two middle-aged white guys. Do you mind if we kill your daughter? Um, but the parents were all four sides. It doesn't matter. Um, unfortunately, the parents, they all knew how important the event was to their kids. They were all very supportive. And the kids, of course, had no problems adjusting because by then they were all used to broadcasting themselves. Um, it's also, you know, in a certain way, it's kind of cheating because the subject matter, slam poetry, uh, is you know all about kids who are uh, voluntarily sculpting their experiences and their lives into stories that they tell on stage. So their passion is figuring out how to most beautifully, most powerfully express themselves. Uh, they're slam poets. That's what they do. Uh, so it wasn't much of a stretch for them to get in front of the camera and start performing. Uh, we ended up shooting for nine months, uh, from the start of the school year to the end. And uh, all in all, we shot about 350 hours of footage. Um, it then took us two full years to cut all that down to a 99 minute movie. Um, we actually finished the film on a Tuesday evening in March of 2010. And two days later, it was supposed to premiere at the Cleveland Film Festival. Um, so when we first played it, I mean, we basically like drove with it to Cleveland um, so that we knew where the tape was all the time. And when we first played it, we didn't even know if it would actually work, um, let alone if anybody would like it. Uh, the first audience that saw it was kind of a, in a room like this, a, a theater full of about 250 inner city uh, Cleveland high school students. Um, we just we had no idea how they were going to react, and it was really kind of terrifying. It's like, here's your thing, you've been working on two years, and now it's bringing it on people, and nobody's seen it yet. So at the Q&A session afterwards, one of the kids stood up and said, I just want to speak for everybody here and say, that was the best true story movie we've ever seen, and everybody burst into applause. And that was when we were kind of like, huh, we might have something here. So that was really awesome to see. My, my partner ended up. Um, so the film ended up winning the Audience Award at the festival, and a bunch more awards after that, and playing in theaters around the country. Eventually, it was uh, aired nationally on TV at the Oprah Winfrey Network, and it's since screened all over the world, which has been great. I even got to follow it, uh, to go with it to Africa uh, as part of a U.S. State Department program. Uh, I partnered with the Burma and Angola. So the film has taken us all over the place, which has been really, really fun. But by far the coolest thing is that uh, over the past few years, the organization that runs uh, the bomb, which you'll see, called Young Chicago Authors, uh, has used the film to start competitions like this in 10 cities around the country, with more on the way, including some international. So um, that means that the film you know, that we spent all this time making has now uh, been responsible for thousands more kids than are in Chicago, getting the life-changing experience a big a part of Latin and Islam. So that, as of all the things that have happened with the film, that is by far been the most gratifying. So the film has actually helped people change their lives. And that, you know, 
couldn't ask for anything else. Um, now, a lot of this I know probably makes no sense. Yeah. 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 Just trust me, we've done a lot of these QA sessions. And these are some of that I just answered some of the questions that are the questions that I'll be asked afterwards. So hopefully, at least you'll know that. Um, and since I can't be there uh, this afternoon to answer the questions, I just want to invite everybody to, if you have a question that's different from that, or even just that, and you happen to be asleep during this, um, please feel free to email me to get the contact info from Ms. Wilson. I'm happy to answer any other questions or whatever you have. Um, I want to take questions from people in a second, but um, uh, before doing that, I just want to add a few thoughts uh, beyond that of the bottom about the theme of the day, uh, which is creativity. Um, so as you'll see, Lab of the bottom is, is kind of pretty much a half an hour long advertisement for arts and education, uh, for the need for kids, for students like you, to be able to express yourselves, uh, to tell your stories, and just as importantly, to listen to the stories of other people and your peers. But it's also important to remember that creativity isn't just something that happens in the arts. Uh, I know I used to think that there were like creative jobs and then there were not creative jobs. So, you know, being a writer or a musician or something, that's a creative job. Being like an accountant or a dentist, not a creative job. But I've now learned in the years since how completely wrong everything is. Uh, how, you know, every field has uh, its own kind of creativity. In fact, yesterday I was listening to the radio and they had a, uh, a piece on how they, they studied um, the brains of mathematicians as they were watching, as they were looking at um, formulas. And they found that mathematicians' brains respond differently to more elegantly constructed formulas, formulas they consider beautiful, than other ones, formulas that aren't as beautiful. So it's just an example of how, uh, how much creativity can you know, go into things, language you don't understand. Um, so what I've realized is that uh, creativity can be a part of anything that involves figuring out how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And that can apply to pretty much any activity you can think of. I mean, solving a math problem, writing a business, writing an essay, or uh, since it's Valentine's Day, asking someone out for the first time. Um, but what you have to keep in mind with these things is that the creativity doesn't necessarily come from things going the way you plan. Uh, the real creativity, the scary part, and also the really fun part, uh, comes from the unpredictable, the unexpected, the accidental, and the disruptive. Uh, so it's only when there are obstacles or things that don't go as planned that all the thought and all the practice and all the hard work you put into something pays off. Uh, it wasn't just the unexpected accident of driving past that club on that particular night on that particular, at that particular time that led to Loud and Bob. It was the years of work that, without me even knowing it, prepared me to react the way we needed to react. Uh, so I guess my message ultimately is this. Uh, be ready when the accidents happen. Because they will, and since you're all creative people, you shouldn't want any other way. Uh, 